part of the Chief Counsel for the House Judiciary Committee's Subcommittee on the Constitution, Civil Rights, and Civil Liberties. Uh, thank you all for being here at this briefing today on, the, uh, on behalf of uh, the House Judiciary Committee Chairman, Gerald Nadler. Uh, I want to thank everyone for attending this briefing on the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights. Uh, you know, the Chairman Nadler would have been here, uh, but for the fact that he's actually right now chairing a full committee hearing on assault weapons. Topic, <laughs> so it will require his full attention. Um, uh, among other things that are happening in the Judiciary <laughs> Committee today, uh, just to the commission is a uh, bipartisan independent federal government commission, established in 1957 for uh, the purpose of investigating and reporting on and making recommendations to policymakers concerning civil rights issues in the United States. The committee has played an important role with respect to a number of areas of concern for Congress. Speaking specifically for the House Judiciary Committee, I know that the committee, that, that the committee is currently engaged in an effort to consider and pass legislation that would provide the Voting Rights Act's pre-clearance provision, as well as other enhancements to the Voting Rights Act in the wake of the Supreme Court's 2013 decision in Shelby County v. Holder, uh, which effectively gutted the pre-clearance provision of that act. This was the most important uh, enforcement mechanism of the Voting Rights Act, um, and it did so by striking down the uh, act's formula determining which jurisdictions would be subject to preclearance. Just as a slight preclearance uh, requires certain jurisdictions with a history of discriminating racial discrimination in voting to uh, submit any changes to their voting laws or practices to the Justice Department or to the U.S. District Court here in D.C. Uh, to get pre-approval before they can make those changes. It was, you know, the stop harmful things from going into place before they happened, before the Supreme Court effectively cut it down. So we've been without that for six years. I one of the committee's main priorities this year, this Congress, is to pass legislation to come up with a new formula to reinvigorate that, uh, that provision. The commissions uh, uh, did a report uh, issued last uh, fall, 2018, on the state of voting rights in America. It's been a vital part of our efforts in this regard. Um, and we made the, both the report the part of the, commit, uh, the committee's official record that will support our efforts in passing. Uh, passing uh, Reform legislation on the Voting Rights Act. In addition, uh, Chair Catherine Lehman, who the Commission uh, testified before the Constitutional Subcommittee <coughs> earlier this year uh, about the report about the Commission's findings, um, again, to add to the record that we will need to develop to uh, include this legislation. And actually, just yesterday, we had another hearing on, also in this voting rights space on Congress's constitutional authority uh, to uh, address voting rights, uh, to protect voting rights in the wake of the Shelby County decision. And another commissioner, uh, Dave uh, uh, Billet, uh, who uh, actually argued the Shelby County case on behalf of, I believe it was the NAACP the uh, Legal uh, Defense and Education Fund at the time, uh, testified in front of the subcommittee yesterday. So the commission and its members have been active in our efforts on the voting rights front. Uh, and it's very helpful and relying a great deal on their work. Um, beyond voting rights, I know other areas that the commission has been working on that are up of interest to the House Judiciary Committee, hate crimes and white nationalism, police use of force. We did a major full committee policing hearing last week, um, and then just civil rights enforcement generally in the federal government, which you know, you know, our part comes out of the subcommittee. It's also uh, work from our oversight team. We you know, sent a number of letters in this area. Uh, so, all in all, the commission covers uh, studies a lot of important issues that are of great interest to the House Judiciary Committee and of great interest to Congress generally. Uh, the main purpose of today's briefing is to educate a new generation of members and staff about the Commission's work and its importance to Congress. The importance to Congress. We have a distinguished group of panelists here who will talk about their experiences and work with the Commission. Uh, once again, on behalf of Chairman Nadler, thank you for coming to the briefing and uh, thank the participants for being here today. And I look forward to an interesting discussion. Uh, and we have here. Uh, Congresswoman uh, Deb Holland, uh, who uh, I'll just give a brief introduction to you. She wants you to give uh, remarks. Uh, so, Representative Deb Holland is serving her first term representing New Mexico's first congressional district, along with Representative Sharice Davis. Uh, Representative Holland is one of the first two Native American women to be elected to Congress. Uh, Representative Holland is the vice chair of the Committee on Natural Resources and a member of the Committee on Armed Services. So, she has been a champion of Native American causes. Uh, during her time in Congress, working passionately to ensure that indigenous women receive the same pay as white women, and drawing attention to the urgent and growing crisis of violence against the Congresswoman. Thank you, 
Good morning, everyone. Good morning. And I should say that I want I want all women to be paid equally. Yeah. <laughs> is, you know, it, it's an exception to the rule. We get paid the same as our male counterparts, so. So good on the United States for that. <laughs> Greetings, everyone, and thank you so much for the opportunity to share a few words today. I really want to give uh, a, a strong note of gratitude to Chairman Nadler, um, not only for inviting me here today, but his strong stance on so many issues. Uh, here at Congress. He is an amazing leader. He's been very, very strong, unwavering on one issue that I'm completely passionate about, missing and murdered Indigenous women. And I couldn't be more grateful for his support and his leadership in this Congress. I have a lot of mentors, uh, people that I look up to, and uh, he's definitely one of them. So I wanted just to, to make sure everybody knew how important um, he is and how important his voice is to our Congress. I'd also like to thank um, Catherine Lehman. Thank you so much, Chair of the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights and the esteemed panelists, guests, and organizations who helped make this event possible. Since 1957, this organization has been a shining light on the factors that contribute to inequality and disparities in all of our communities. I'm particularly grateful for the Commission's work on the Broken Promises Report. Uh, this groundbreaking study evaluated the extent to which the federal government has failed to meet its trust and treaty responsibilities to Native American nations. For those who may not be aware, trust and treaty responsibilities are legal promises the United States government has made to Indian tribes to provide resources for things like housing, education, healthcare, self-determination, and public safety. Uh, and, and mostly in exchange for land, and in fact we're on Indian land right now, uh, this whole country was at one time Indian land. And so uh, largely those treaties went to make sure that uh, the United States government uh, had the land it needed to expand, but it also made these promises in exchange for peace and other types of concessions. The report concluded that federal programs designed to support the social and economic well-being of tribal nations and native peoples remain chronically underfunded and poorly structured. The report put it bluntly, the United States expects all nations to live up to their treaty obligations and it should live up to its own. Reports like this are important not only because they highlight where our country is falling short of its ideals and duties, but also where we as Congress can take action. Senator Warren and I saw the Broken Promises report as just that, a call to action. That's why last month we released a proposal for a forthcoming bill honoring promises to Native Nations Act. The proposal's five titles, mirroring the five chapters of the Broken Promises Report, highlight areas where the federal government has failed to fulfill its trust responsibilities, including criminal justice and public safety, health care, education, housing, and economic development, and propose options for addressing the chronic underfunding of programs associated with these areas to strengthen the well-being of all Native American communities and their ability to function as self-governing entities. We have opened a public discussion on the proposal and we're seeking feedback from tribal governments and citizens alike, tribal organizations, experts, and other stakeholders in advance of the bill's introduction in Congress later this year. It's thanks to the independent research and analysis of the United States Commission on Civil Rights and the commitment to enhancing federal civil rights policy that we have this momentum and this framework to build support, to build upon, I'm sorry, to build upon and to move from broken promises to honoring promises. Finally, as we celebrate Hispanic Heritage Month, 
I'd like to acknowledge the work of our Hispanic and Latinx civil rights leaders like Dolores Huerta, one of my mentors, born in my great state of New Mexico. We claim her as a New Mexican. <laughs> uh, she has fought tirelessly to defend the rights of women and workers and to organize communities to claim their power. As an organizer myself, I know how important it is to empower our people to make bold change and stand up against injustice. The USCCR also has an important role to play in this legacy, highlighting when federal investments in worker benefits and protections, access to education, voting rights, and criminal justice are not reaching immigrants, ethnic and religious minorities, and people of color equally and making recommendations for how to rectify these issues. Today, that work is more important than ever as we search for ways for our country to uphold and defend the rights of its citizens and those seeking to become citizens. I thank you all. I thank the USCCR for this work, this important work in advancing civil rights policy. And I look forward to continuing that work together and um, thank you all so much for making this a part of your day. I want to acknowledge Chief Lynn Malerba uh, here on the front row, a tribal chief from the Mohegan tribe in Connecticut. And um, I, I, I just know that um, I'm grateful that Indian tribes um, feel that they have a home here. And I'm really happy that you're here today. So thank you all so much. Thank you. We are expecting possibly that uh, at least two uh, traditional members to come. Uh, so when they do, we'll uh, pause. Oh, actually. <laughs> um, so being joined actually by uh, Congressman uh, Derek Chelmer. <laughs> Perfect timing. <laughs> uh, uh, so I'll do a quick introduction. You know, by Congressman Chelmer to your remarks. Uh, Congressman Derek Chelmer has represented Washington's Sixth Congressional District since 2013. Uh, Representative Kilmer serves as the chair of the Select Committee on the Modernization of Congress, as well as on the House Appropriations Committee. Um, he has long fought to reform our nation's electoral process, and when the House passed HR 1 this earlier this year, it included two of Representative Kilmer's bills: uh, the Honest Ads Act and the Restoring Integrity to America's Election Act, uh, both which are intended to protect and strengthen our elections. Uh, to give a few sure. Thanks. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Um, uh, before I begin, I just want to uh, thank Chairman Nadler and his absence, who uh, uh, undoubtedly he has nothing else on his mind today. <laughs> um, uh, but I appreciate his um, convening this panel. And um, I also would like to thank the chairwoman and, and former Chair Castro, uh, all of you. Uh, for your, your important leadership um, and for your invitation to speak today. Um, and Ambassador Morella and uh, Dave and Susan, and everyone in the audience here, thank you as well. Um, thanks for being here. And I, I actually want to start by just telling a story. So I'm standing with former Chair Castro uh, in a village called Tahola, which is the lower reservation of the Quinault Indian Nation. And uh, the nation's president, Fawn Sharp, takes us up a little incline uh, as we look out at the Pacific Ocean. And she says, when I was a kid, that ocean was a football field's length away. And she said, now it's our front porch. She explained that her village has been there since time immemorial. But in recent years, it's begun to see the threats of uh, rising sea levels and more severe storms, not to mention the threat of tsunami. And she, um, that story and the story of uh, four other tribes in my district um, that are, as we sit here today, in the process of trying to move to higher ground deserves to be told. Um, when President Sharp said, you know, we now, every time we see a severe storm, our village fills up like a bowl, um, that story deserves to be told. And that's why I was so grateful for the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights for actually listening to that story. There's a Native American icon from my region, a guy named Billy Frank Jr., um, who was an extraordinary guy. Uh, he was a really interesting guy. Um, he swore a lot. Uh, and, and, <laughs> 
I was not always sure he knew my name because every time he saw me, he called me Jesus Christ. Um, <laughs> but uh, you know, one of the, one of his mottos was "Tell your story, tell your story, tell your story, tell your story." And he said, if you want to advocate, you need to tell your story. And storytelling is, I think, essential to change. But in order for that to happen, for change to happen, someone actually needs to be listening. Someone needs to hear that story. And too often, there's no one listening to communities of color or disadvantaged populations when they tell their story. And that's why the US Commission on Civil Rights is so important. For over 60 years, the US Commission on Civil Rights has listened, listened, and they've detailed in sharp focus the inequity uh, that communities face, including tri tribal communities uh, in our nation face, um, not to men mention other injustices. And let me tell you how that's played out for a district like mine. In 2003, the commission released a report called the Quiet Crisis Report that showed that our government has had systemic failures in living up to its tribal treaty obligations. And just last year, they updated that report with a new one titled Broken Promises, Continuing Federal Funding Shortfalls for Native Americans. And honestly, it, it provides an incredible roadmap for Congress and for federal agencies to follow in meeting our trust and treaty obligations. Um, I can tell you a whole bunch of other stories, stories about uh, tribes that don't have access to the internet, uh, tribes that are struggling with housing inadequacies, tribes that are facing other extraordinary uh, challenges. And um, uh, unfortunately, there are tribal communities in my region and around our country that face a number of challenges. We know they have a higher rate of substance abuse than the general population. They have generally lower graduation rates. They have underfunded schools and police forces. They lack economic development opportunities. And these are real problems, and too often, these communities are ignored, but the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights actually took the time to listen and to speak up for those communities. They're listening to voices and stories not just from across my region, but across the country. And um, your work is a big part of that, and it's a big part, frankly, of why Congress is taking action on a number of civil rights issues. It's a big reason the House has already passed the Equality Act. It's a big reason that the House is taking up the issue of voting rights. So I just want to end by saying thank you. Thank you to the Commission. Uh, not just for having me, um, but on behalf of my constituents. Thank you for inviting them to tell their stories and to listen. Thank you for listening. Thank you for shining a light on injustice and disparity and making sure that our nation keeps its promise uh, to, to everyone. So thank you for that. Thanks for the important work you do. Thank you. Introducing uh, the chair of the uh, U.S. Commission on Civil Rights, uh, Catherine Lehman. Uh, Catherine Lehman is chair of the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights. Uh, President Obama appointed her to a six-year term on the uh, commission on December 15, 2016, and the commission unanimously confirmed the president's designation to her of her to chair the commission on December 28, 2016. Uh, she also serves in the cabinet of California Governor Gavin Newsom, uh, where she has been legal affairs secretary since January of this year. Uh, she previously litigated civil rights cases at the National Center for Youth Law. Uh, before coming to the commission, she served as the Assistant Secretary for Civil Rights at the U.S. Department of Education uh, from August 2013 until January 2017. Uh, previous, before then, she was Director of Impact Litigation at Public Counsel, the nation's largest pro bono law firm. Before that, she practiced for a decade at the ACLU of Southern California, ultimately as Assistant Legal Director. Uh, Chair Lehman received her JD from Yale Law School where she was the outstanding woman law graduate, and she graduated summa cum laude from Amherst College. She served as a law clerk for the Honorable William A. Norris on the United States Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit. Thank you very much for that introduction to the panel and also for welcoming us on behalf of the Hospital We were delighted to hear from Representative Kilmer and also from Representative Holland, and so much appreciated working with them and their civil rights leadership here in Congress. Uh, I want to make sure that we get quickly to this panel and that we can use our time uh, to hear from this panel. But I wanted to say how delighted I am to be with you all today and to join our very distinguished panel. Uh, and 
Uh, just to share, for 62 years, the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights has been charged by Congress to be the nation's eyes and ears with respect to civil rights and to advise the President, Congress, and the American people about the status of civil rights. We are enormously proud to have influenced all of the federal civil rights laws enacted in that time. And as uh, we've heard earlier today, we are eager to be able to participate in advising Congress on enactment of further civil rights laws as needed. Uh, we are humbled and immensely grateful for the uh, charge from Congress to uh, represent the views of the nation with respect to civil rights and uh, uh, to advise about what the country can do better with respect to civil rights policy. Moving into our panel, uh, I will say just brief introductions for each of the panelists and then we'll start with some questions and I want to leave time for questions from our audience at the end as well. So starting, Ambassador Connie Morella is now the Ambassador in Residence for the Women in Politics Institute at American University. She served as U.S. House Representative for Maryland's 8th District from 1987 to 2003 and was the U.S. Ambassador to the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development from 2003 to 2007. Next to her is David McGuire. He's the Executive Director of the ACLU of Connecticut and he also serves as the Chair of the Commission's Connecticut Advisory Committee. Next to David is Susan Burrow, who is the co-founder, president, and board chair of the Heather Heyer Foundation. The Heather Heyer Foundation was created to honor Heather Heyer, a young civil rights activist who dedicated her life to promoting equal rights for all people, and whom a white supremacist killed in an act of hate in Charlottesville, Virginia, in 2007. And finally, Marty Castro, president and CEO of Castro Synergies, LLC, President Obama, appointed Marty Castro to the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights in 2011, where he served as chair until 2016. He was, I will note, the first Latino chair of the commission, and he also previously, previously served as the chair of the Illinois Advisory Committee to the commission. So, starting with questions, my first question to each of you, but we'll start with Ambassador Amanda, uh, is I hope that you will briefly describe your work in civil rights and how you've interacted with the commission to fulfill your civil rights. Good. Well, I'm Connie Morell and I approve this message. <laughs> I, I, I'm very pleased to be here to shine a bright light on the Commission of Civil Rights. And I know that a number of you are staff in offices. I served for 16 years in the House of Representatives, including with, with uh, Congressman, uh, Chief of Chairman Nadler, uh, and of course Marcy Kafka, who is the longest serving woman in the history of the United States House of Representatives. So maybe she'll call. Maybe not. I want to thank uh, uh, Chairwoman uh, Lehman and the other distinguished members of this panel. I really appreciate their being here and I look forward to learning from them too. Um, I, um, as I say, I served for 16 years and as a former member, I believe that my role is to be a partner and a critic. I continue to be a political junkie who loves and uh, follows and believes in Congress. I associate myself with the sentiment of W.B. Gibbs, who said, I was there to wind the clock. I came to hear it strike. So this is, again, something, a testament to the fact that I continue to be involved in what you are doing. As far as staff are concerned, and a number of you are staff, I always used to say, from the 23rd Psalm, my rod and my staff, they comfort me and prepare the papers for me in the presence of my constituents. <laughs> You're the ones who really have the know. You're the ones who in the busy lives of these members of Congress get in there and say, you know, this is an important issue. It affects our constituency, it affects our country, and you've heard from so-and-so and so-and-so. And so. I think we should be very much involved. Okay, point of personal privilege, and I know I have to be brief, is the fact that uh, my, my husband was a lawyer with the commission in the late 50s. He investigated voting irregularities in Louisiana parishes, where blacks were often purged from the voter rolls and the committee. The Long Dynasty, the White Citizens Council, registered blacks to vote, but only let them vote when they need them. Voting registrars, as you know, but this is sort of a reiteration of what you know, uh, asked disqualifying questions, literacy tests, found spe spelling errors that had nothing to do with the person who wanted to vote, required two witnesses um, to show cause 
why you shouldn't be struck from the from the wall. Um, and at that time, Bob Esper was uh, one of the commissioners, and Spotswood Robinson the third. The commission's 1959 and 61 reports on voting rights laid the foundation for the Civil Rights Act of 1964, and also the commission's report on the discrimination of African Americans in the South became the basis of the Voting Rights Act of 1965. I guess I really have to uh, to jump forward in terms of how the, the many pieces where I was uh, uh, involved in legislation in addition to you know, Violence Against Women Act and uh, uh, trafficking, uh, but also in 1983, looking back at the commission's goal, the uh, commission released a report entitled Accommodating the Spectrum of Individual Abilities. And this, and this is a document that is often cited as the beginning of, you know, the Americans with Disabilities Act, which has made such a great difference. I was a co-sponsor of the act, of course. Uh, the influence of the commission didn't stop there. Eight years after its passage, the commission conducted a two-day hearing on the ADA and its impact, which says something else about the commission. It doesn't stop with recommendations. It helps to monitor and follow through on how uh, they are being implemented. Um, and on the law's practical impact on those it was intended to serve. Um, another example, in 2001, when I was in Congress, the Commission issued a report entitled Voting Irregularities in Florida during the, the 2000 presidential election and made recommendations applicable to Florida and applicable to the nation. Congress subsequently included many of the Commission's recommendations in a national reform bill that became the Help America Vote Act. Health Act of 2002, for which I voted. The law mandated improvements to voting systems and voter access. And, and I'm pleased with the continuing work of the Commission with its 51 state uh, state advisory uh, committees, which were uh, the eyes and ears on the lookout for in their areas uh, of what needs to be done. And they have an independent. Finally, and I, I, there are other things I could talk about what the, uh, the many different reviews that are being done now, including even sexual harassment. And I just recently served on the National uh, Sciences Foundation the, uh, on sexual harassment in academia, on science, engineering, and medicine. <coughs> many, uh, not only academic institutions have looked at that report, uh, but private enterprises have in Congress that because you had a hearing also, the commission did, on sexual harassment and it affected the federal workforce. That commission had the one I served on, National Science Foundation, National Institutes of Health, uh, the uh, NOAA, uh, the Luce Foundation. So it was put together so as the eyes and ears of the nation are on it, and the commission is right there doing its part. So um, it needs to continue, and we're in purple. It just occurred to me as I was driving here why to show it's important to be bipartisan. Mm -hmm. Nothing good happens unless you get both sides together. And how does that happen? You listen with people of different opinions, you learn, and you lead. And so I can't emphasize that more. I'm going, I don't think, okay, I'll quote from all my materials, I'll put aside, because <laughs> you know you know what the commission does. George Washington, when he was fifteen, will Rules of civility and decent behavior. Rule number one, when in the company of others, act with respect for those who are present. I think that is a model that we should all follow. And in so doing, we can converse, we can work together, we can compromise, we can come up with things that are nonpartisan, bipartisan. Thank you. That's a tough act to follow. Um, I'm David McGuire. I'm the chair of the Connecticut State Advisory Committee. And I don't have quite as, as uh, long experience with the commission, but just as positive. Um, I have been practicing civil rights law for the ACLU for just 12 years this month, actually. 
and my first interaction with the commission was in 2011. Um, I'll talk about this a little bit more, hopefully, but Connecticut is one of the most polarized and segregated states in the country. And at that point, the SAC came in to evaluate the effectiveness of the 1999 racial profiling law. That was a law passed in the memorial of an African-American senator in Connecticut who was racially profiled. And that law known as the Penn Act sought to unwind racial profiling and create real transparency. The cornerstone was data collection, which was really not being complied with. And me and my role as staff attorney with the East of Connecticut at the time, coming and hawing about it, but really to an unreceptive legislature. Um, the State Advisory Committee came in and held a briefing and brought in national experts and really shone a light on the problem in Connecticut. In the subsequent couple of years, the state legislature did acknowledge the problem, completely retooled the law, and now it is a national leader. Uh, the states of California and Oregon have modeled their laws off ours, and although we've not eradicated racial profiling, we've gone a long way to proving that it exists and, and ameliorated some of the harms of it. So I have been very, very fond of the, uh, the commission and the SACs for a long while, and then several years later I was invited to become a member, and now I'm in my third year as chair. So I hope it's tell more about that time, but it is an amazing entity, and I'm happy to be here today. We didn't clap for him. <laughs> Sorry, an old school teacher here. I <laughs> appreciate <laughs> uh, My name is Susan Rowe. I'm the newest member uh, um, to civil rights work probably in the world. Um, my daughter was killed in 2017. And um, it was brought to my attention yesterday that people often speculate why they don't cry every time I talk about it. But for one thing, you can't go around living in grief. You have to move on with your life. And I, I do cry for my daughter, but not in public. That's a private matter to me. So um, my experience with the board, and I want to thank the board, by the way, for inviting me to speak today is um, dealing with issues of white nationalism. And unfortunately, um, white nationalism has taken hold around the world. It's not just in our country. Um, I was often approached by foreign press from around the world to talk about what happened in Charlottesville so that um, it could help stem the tide of white nationalism in elections in their countries, and it did not work. Um, I'm too far removed from those countries and people, I guess, probably couldn't really relate um, what they were seeing with what's happening. I'm hoping that as we move forward in our work in the, this country, that the Commission and others speaking um, out on these issues can help uh, provide a, a model for how we deal with white nationalism or white supremacy in its uh, extreme forms. Um, to um, deal with that so that other countries can follow suit because I can tell you people around the world are quite dismayed with what they see and they really don't know how to deal with it. One of the issues that we've discovered in this country is that we have huge gaps in uh, crime statistic reporting and um, I'm actually doing a press conference with others this afternoon about that because there is an act a bipartisan act that has been dropped in the House and the Senate, the Khalid Jabara Heather Heyer No Hate Act. And I pulled up the numbers because I, I see you taking taking note. <laughs> okay, so it's uh, Senate 2043 and House uh, 3545. Uh, we actually have bipartisan sponsorship in the House, not in the Senate. Um, I'll work on that. <laughs> uh, Either way. Uh, and um, someone asked me last week, well, that's lovely, but what difference does it make? Um, I often use the analogy of if you take your child to the doctor, the doctor cannot just look at the child and make a diagnosis. You have to take a full range of the symptoms. So if you have the American dream the way I have, and I have been so fortunate to live those dreams, but as chairman of the Civil Rights Commission uh, and in other roles that I held, I realized that that American dream still remains almost unattainable for many. 
And the key to making sure that that dream, those dreams are attainable, has been and continues to be the work of the commission. Uh, when I was sent by President Obama to chair the commission, it was probably at one of the heights of the dysfunction and uh, non and bitter uh, partisanship that the commission had. So a lot of the work that we did, uh, we did focused on not only the external reports, and I'm proud of all the reports we issued, but also on bringing uh, bipartisanship back and bringing uh, accountability back to the commission. And I learned the importance of that bipartisanship when I first became involved with the commission family. Uh, I was appointed to the Illinois SAC, uh, and the way the process works is that uh, commissioners recommend individuals of prominence uh, and civil rights in their communities to the commission, and the commission evaluates those candidates and appoints them. And uh, I was honored to have been recommended as a Democrat by a Republican to serve in the uh, Illinois State Advisory Committee by Commissioner Jennifer Braceras. And to me, that taught me, and even as the State Advisory worked, we worked together in a bipartisan fashion. So that's how I was brought up within the Commission family. And that's what I tried to do when I became chairperson, is try to bring that level of bipartisanship. But also, even though I was the first Latino chairperson of the Commission, and I'm proud of that, I also wanted to ensure that I was the chairperson for all Americans and all residents of this country. So the scope of the reporting that we did uh, tried to reflect that. And the other thing that uh, was important to me as a former SAC member was to be able to further rely on this beautiful network, 51 state advisory committees. All states and, uh, and D.C. have a state advisory committee even in some states that don't have their own Human Rights or Civil Rights Commission. I also shared the Illinois Human Rights Commission uh, in the past. So we as a network of commissions uh, really bring the issues and the, the, the challenges forward to the nation. So we, under my chairmanship, strengthened the SAC network. We extended the terms from two years to four years so that they would have more time to do their work. We streamlined and made more efficient the nomination process and increased the accountability. And then we engaged with our SACs more. We tried to do tandem work with them. I, as chairman, traveled across the country to numerous state advisory committee hearings, whether it was in Ferguson in the aftermath of what happened there, uh, whether, as Congressman Kilmer indicated, uh, through the work that we were doing in our, our reports to go to reservations like the Quinault Nation, uh, or the Wind River Reservation in Wyoming, uh, or my last day as chairman literally was at the Dakota Access Pipeline, continuing the work that we started under my chairmanship for the Broken Promises Report, which was issued under uh, Chairman Landon. So uh, to me, the strengths of the commission are its ability to have these networks, but also the independence of the commission. Uh, that's not stressed enough. While we are all appointed by uh, partisan entities and by uh, the President or Congress or the Senate, uh, Democrats, Republicans, or independents, uh, we really have to realize that the work that we do should not um, be dictated by who appoints us. And I'm proud of the fact that, that for example, uh, one of the reports that we put out, and I'm like my children, I'm proud of all my reports. Uh, but one that, that, uh, that sticks out is the one we did on immigration detention centers in 2015. Uh, and we went physically and visited detention centers uh, in Texas, the uh, Carnes Family Detention Center in Port Isabel. And we talked directly to mothers and children who had just started to come, unaccompanied minors and, and mothers and children that just started to come and be detained by the uh, federal government under the Obama administration. And we put out a very strong report about the discrepancies and the failure of our own administration to meet our obligations as a country to those individual immigrants and refugees. I remember talking to mothers who told me they were being threatened to have their children taken away from them. And this is in 2015. And so we issued a report identifying all those things. Because even though I was an Obama appointee, and even though the majority of the commission were Obama appointees, we felt that our role as a civil rights commission is to be independent to look at whether our federal government or our state governments are doing what they need to do, regardless of who is at the helm. And so I'm proud of that fact, as well as many of the other things that we did. I wouldn't go into more, but uh, those are just a couple of examples of, of the things that I think are really important about the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights. Thank you. This is a, a heads up to the audience. I'm going to 
save time for you all to ask questions. I'm going to ask one question for each panelist, and then I will turn to you. So if you want to start thinking about your questions now, I'm asking you, Marla, you ended your remarks talking a bit about the value of bipartisanship, and we've heard a little bit about it from other panelists. I hope you could reflect on what it means as a statutory design for the commission that we must be bipartisan. And I note that civil rights legislation that you co-sponsored in your time in the House uh, was always a bipartisan. And, and, I, and I hope you could speak to us a bit about uh, why it's important for uh, us to be a bipartisan commission and for, for that work to be I think it's particularly important that you, who are on the Hill, I'll help to forge bipartisanship. It wasn't that long ago that I that I was on the Hill, and I was uh, in in my district. I was a minority in terms of voter registration, and so the first thing I did, maybe that was part of it, but it was something I wanted to serve all the people. When I would introduce legislation, I would go find a Democrat to get on, and the Democrats would come to me to get me on their bill too to make it bipartisan. Why? Because we knew that was going to lead to the road to success. We knew it was going to appeal to our voters to know these people work together. Now, people don't really think hard when they think about working together. And now things seem to have been changing. You're part of what seems to be a little bit of tribalism that, that occurs. So it's important that you be the ones to reach across the aisle to talk to, uh, to, talk to those of the other party. I find even the members of Congress, I go on trips with them now because I'm part of group called Franklin Center for Interparliamentary Work. And we take Democrats and Republicans, and sometimes to them it's the first time they got to know each other. The first time to know they had a kid in school or something they had in common. So I get back to that idea of you forging relationships which you will convey to your office. Um, why is it important? It, it's like I've been involved with the Office of Research on Women's Health, getting it set up. And I've often said, you know, there is a, a male gene and a female gene, but there's not a Republican gene and a Democratic gene. And it's the same way with a lot of those issues. I mean, when you're talking about white supremacy and hate crimes and the, uh, the LGBTQ issues, those issues, they're not really partisan at the root of it. So I say this is um, this is your challenge. Shakespeare once wrote, "In such business, action is eloquence." And so I would submit to you, be eloquent with your actions. I think you are the rulers and shakers. Mr. Water, you uh, have been leading the Connecticut Advisory Committee, and I really love hearing from you a bit about the success from the Advisory Committee and the value of state-specific independent evaluations by enterprise the commission as well as uh, your state and local community about supporters. Sure. So over the last three years, our state advisory committee has had some real impact on state policy. Um, and I think it goes to the point of the fact we are a bipartisan, incredible group that does not have an agenda. So we're able to come in and have a briefing and really convene thought leaders from both our state and, and around the country to explore an issue in Connecticut. And as I mentioned in my opening remarks, Connecticut is a state with deep polarization and segregation. So we have some real significant racial justice issues, and we as a stack of Democrats, Republicans, and Independents to be able to come together and recognize that the issue of racial bias and racial discrimination is one that our stack needs to focus on. Um, so the first thing that we took up when I came here in 2017 was the use of solitary confinement. We had um, heard anecdotes and there have been news stories about disparities in who is in our correction system, that's for sure, but even greater racial disparities in who is in what is referred to as solitary confinement. So in February of that year, right in the beginning of our legislative session, we convened a briefing and brought in uh, corrections experts and uh, law professors um, and had our correction commissioner as well come and speak to the, the SAC at a televised briefing. We also were able to get a tour of several prisons in Connecticut. Um, we have a unified prison system where the jails and prisons are run by one commissioner, and we reached out um, through folks in D.C. and got those tours of our supermax, for example, and really got to see, in, you know, from a first-hand perspective, the issues that we had. 
Um, we really quickly pulled together a memo that advised uh, folks in Washington and ultimately had an impact in Connecticut. And we were one of the first states to pass a law that now bans the use of solitary confinement for juveniles. We had learned through our, through our briefing and through our tours that, in fact, there are folks that are under, were under 18 in adult facilities in solitary confinement. Um, we also pushed for and were successful getting some really rigorous data reporting, which is coming in now. One of the great benefits of the SAC um, and the independence is that we're able to follow up on things as well. So you know, we're able to check in and make sure that the work that we've started is actually progressing, which is something that state legislators often don't have the, the foresight to do. Um, and the bipartisanship is absolutely huge. Um, I'll briefly touch on the second thing that we did this year, which was again, really bipartisan and led to some unanimous legislation getting through the state capital in Connecticut. Um, again, we had noticed through our research that there are these great disparities in who is in our prison system in Connecticut. Um, essentially the inverse of the state. The state has a population of about 30% black and brown folks, um, and our prison population is 70%, so almost inverse. So we wanted to figure out the root of this problem, and we are unique in that we have appointed prosecutors. We're one of the three states, along with New Jersey, and Alaska who have appointed prosecutors. So the SAC decided we would pull the briefing, uh, and we did so in April of this year to explore the unique appointing process and whether or not that some of that bias that we see, uh, some of those inequities and the racial disparities that we see at the end of the process is born through prosecutors and their decisions. And we were able to pull together a panel, a first panel of prosecutors from outside of Connecticut. We were able to look at our state and give an opinion as to what is unique and what might be troubling, what we might want to do to look into this. And the second panel we had was one of state legislators and state prosecutors and public defenders who gave their analysis. And ultimately, we were able to put together some recommendations that helped get a bill across the finish line unanimously. Um, and now we will have the most rigorous and wide-ranging data reporting in the country, which we think will allow both the SAC and community leaders and legislators to really get their arms around this problem and tackle it. More exciting yet is that uh, Representative Adams from North Carolina introduced <coughs> legislation based on that. And again, so it's showing that this, this state advisory committee can really have a tremendous impact and pull in and unite ideas and, and thought, thought leaders and decision makers. So I, I highly recommend supporting and engaging with your local SACs. Ms. Bro, you've testified both to the Commission and also to the Virginia Advisory Committee, and I hope that you could talk to us about the value of using both platforms and both resources as you uh, try to further the work of the Foundation. Um, this may sound a little strange, but frankly, being called on by the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights and the uh, Virginia Advisory Board helps lend credence to the fact that Charlottesville existed. Um, as you may know, um, it has often been um, called a conspiracy. It has often been called um, fake, that I'm a fake actor, that Heather either never existed or that she um, was a crisis actor. And um, to be able to give testimony to a government entity actually lends credence. Um, you have to understand that even though those were tried as federal hate crimes and state hate crime, um, they were not reported to the FBI statistics originally. Um, since then, <coughs> frankly, Charlottesville has been embarrassed enough to uh, retroactively report those. Uh, but it, um, it has helped prove that we actually happened and prove that we are part of the historical record of what happened. Um, I'm happy to say one of the people um, who has had the most surgeries had her last surgery yesterday. Um, and, you know, that's two years later, over two years later. Um, so um, we strongly support and believe in the work of the Commission. The commission actually uh, has been a fixture of my life, um, and um, I'm just honored that we are able to be on that record. Mr. Castro, you were, you were speaking at the end of your remarks about uh, the, the work that you did to lead DC and to go to advisory committees, to go to uh, various parts of the United States to hear from 
community members about civil rights violations. Can you speak to us in this room about why it's important for the commission to leave DC and go yeah. to the yeah. I think that's in the commission's DNA. If you know the history of the commission, we've touched a little bit on it at this panel, you know that the original commissioners went out to Jim Crow territory and they held hearings and they did investigations and they held the feet to the fire of the Jim Crow uh, local officials to tra change the way our nation uh, functions. And for many years though, uh, we stopped doing field hearings. We stopped traveling out to parts of the country. So I felt certainly as chairman, it was important for me to get out there and hear from people directly that not staying in the Washington DC echo sphere that we needed to go and hear from real Americans, real people living in our communities as to what was happening there. That's why we strengthened the SACs, but uh, there was no substitute for actually going out there yourself and seeing, walking the streets of Ferguson in the aftermath and seeing what happened in that community. Uh, going to the reservations and talking directly to the tribal leaders in the communities to see how climate change is impacting folks. To do a hearing, a uh, field hearing, the first one we did uh, in Alabama at the height of the immigration reports, uh, the immigration laws that were coming out at the state level, you may recall them, in, in uh, Arizona, in South Carolina, and Georgia, and Alabama. We held a multi-state field hearing in Alabama, uh, where we had started as a, as a commission in Alabama, holding our first hearings. And we talked to those folks who were, again, the, the, the epitome of the folks that were putting forward those laws. In fact, we had criticism from some civil rights activists are why are you bringing those those folks who are uh, hateful to testify? We have to bring everyone before us because we have to put everyone, we have to challenge everyone and hold them accountable. And so those are the unique things that we were able to see, that I was able to see, uh, going out and, and hearing from people directly, whether it was on environmental injustice issues, whether it was the detention centers, the, the Native American reservations, uh, and a whole host of other important things that we then brought forward to the commission and issued reports on them and shared with Congress, and now we see legislation uh, happening. Uh, that is a, the spectrum of tools that the Commission has, and I found those to be very important to me and to the Commission's work. Well, now I'll open for questions from our audience. We have just a few minutes left, and we'd love to make sure that we are responsive to any thoughts and ideas that you have today. <coughs> Hi, um, my name is Anna. Thank you guys all for being here and speaking with us. Um, I work on drug policy in the Senate. Um, and I don't know if you saw, but uh, a few weeks ago there was a Washington Post article about the fentanyl crisis um, and detailing some of Congress's lack of action. And one thing they, they pointed to was a lot of reasons why fentanyl bills or bills addressing opioid and heroin abuse in, in Congress haven't been able to move forward is because there have been really legitimate criminal justice concerns. Um, and I'm wondering if you can sort of speak to, in drug policy, how we balance really legitimate criminal justice concerns against a growing drug epidemic like fentanyl and law enforcement. Um, sure, the, the commission has a, a pretty robust record of criminal justice investigations that are recent and that are ongoing for us. And so we uh, take a look at that, that balance pretty often in the work that we do, and I think that uh, Congress must balance both the, the ongoing criminal justice record uh, and not wanting to get in its way with also evaluating what steps the nation needs for responsive legislation and better protection for the American people. That's a, that's a tension that is inherent in most of the kinds of work that, that we do in the, the civil rights area. And, uh, and it is surmountable, as challenging as it is, uh, but, but you know, as, a, as a litigator, it's important to let that record develop and also investigate what can be investigated separately. I think it's a prime area for bipartisanship because you're hearing from the public, regardless of their party, about what's happening in this state or that state or in that community. And so it's like, can't you do something in Congress? So I think despite differences, and there will be the differences, as you know, despite that, it is an opportunity, I think, for bipartisanship. So one of the things that I, I am concerned about, and of course I'm interested in Native American rights, and I'm so 
thankful for the Broken Promises Report because we will use that and have used it and will continue to use it. But one of the things that I am personally concerned about are assault weapons and how that impacts our civil rights to be able to go to a concert, to go to school as a six-year-old and not die. Um, and so I just wonder you know, what the commission can do to highlight that issue because that is a human right not to be mowed down by weapons of war. Um, and so I just kind of wonder is that, uh, is there a way that you can address that topic um, that, that um, supports the Second Amendment, but remember the Second Amendment was passed when there were muskets, it was a different <laughs> time. Um, and so can the commission get involved in that issue? Because it's heartbreaking to me to continue to see the loss of life around that issue. Uh, well, I, I just want to put in a plug that I voted for the AK-47 ban. <laughs> now that, you know, like, what was so interesting about that is they made a deal with the Rifle Association to make it uh, yeah, out of existence in, what, 10 years? I mean, like, come on. All of a sudden, you can use an assault weapon? You couldn't for this period of time. So I wish them luck with the AK-15. I, I, I want the experts to talk about what the commission can do, but I think putting this and the environment in the hands of the young people is going to help to make that difference. And I, I would simply say, assault weapons do not belong in the hands of anybody who's not in a war. <laughs> So just to speak to what the commission can do, I'll, I'll uh, talk about what's possible and also what we have. The, the commission can vote up to, to take up any civil rights issue, of which this is one, as can each of our uh, state advisory committees. And so we would vote to focus specifically on the, the topic itself. In a recent report, one of our most recent reports was on the uh, discipline in schools of students of color with disabilities. And uh, in the context of that report, we evaluated recommendations to Harvard schools and uh, concerns about external tutors and the validity of those and, and the, the commission's conclusion is that it's important for schools to respect the rights of all students, to make sure that student safety is paramount while educating students, and that, that the uh, focus needs to be on the students themselves rather than on assumptions about who external tutors might be and assumptions about uh, mental illness and, uh, and, and what causes those kinds of students. So we did, we did take up the topic in a recent report in, in the context of a, of a broader investigation about the I'll say as chair of the Connecticut SAC, you know, I, I look to where there are advocates and where there's lots of advocacy in certain spaces. So it is no doubt a civil rights issue. As you know, Connecticut, unfortunately due to Newtown, has some of the most uh, stringent gun regulations in the country and we're really leading in that. So it's a space that our SAC has not seen a, a need to go to because there are lots of advocates there, whereas on some of the racial justice issues, there are crickets. Thank you. And I'll just stop us there because we're just past time. I will say that we have a, a busy few months coming, and uh, we hope to have a busy several months coming after that. But just things to stay tuned for. Uh, in October, we intend to release an update to the report about detention conditions. I am recused from that report, but I'm looking forward to seeing what my fellow commissioners have said in that one. And then in November, we'll release a report on hate crimes and also a report about efficacy of federal civil rights enforcement across 13 federal civil rights agencies now. And we'll hold a briefing on sub-minimum wages for workers with disabilities as well in the 14C labor program. So we have a busy few months coming. We really hope that we will be engaged with you all in those months and in the months that follow. And thank you so much to our panelists for joining us today and for all of you for coming here.